particularly for his role in helping to establish the Australian Centre for Food Integrity. And I'm counting him as a true friend too, because I met him 20 minutes ago and we've just been talking about all manner of uh, media things and sporting events and all was, among other things, Charlie uh, once was a, uh, a football caller on uh, college football in the States. So I'm going to be trying to trawl through YouTube and see if any of your work still exists, Charlie. I might pick up something I can use myself. Uh, these days he's the uh, CEO of the US Centre for Food Integrity and he has a powerful message to share with us about ways in which the Australian lamb industry can build the trust of the consumer. So please welcome, uh, all the way from the US of A, Charlie Arnott. Thank you so much. Well, good morning and thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's always a great opportunity to come back to Australia. And my entire career has been spent in communications. I have a graduate degree, or a degree in, in uh, journalism, graduated from the University of Nebraska. And that's the fine institution where the N on the side of the football helmet stands for knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and one of the things you learn about communications very early is just how absolutely crucial it is to get the right message to the right audience at the right time, when they're most receptive, when you've got the right content, and they're ready, really, to kind of take some action. And I was reminded just how crucial that is a few months ago, fortunate enough to move into a new office building in the Kansas City area, started to unpack, plug our there was a delivery, and it was a floral delivery, and somebody said, it's a really nice plant. And I thought, well, that's really nice. You know, somebody recognized we're moving to kind of brighten the new office up a little bit. So I opened the card, and it said, with our deepest sympathies. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. I've got some strange friends, but nobody quite that strange that I know. So I called the florist. At least I didn't think so. So I called the florist, and I said, you know, I'm not sure this was actually supposed to come to us. Uh, and he said, don't worry about it. I'll check into it, and I'll call you right back. So we continued to unpack boxes and get things set up in the office. And he called back a little while later and he said, gosh, I'm terribly sorry. He said, that was not supposed to come to you, but we do have one for you. We'll bring it right over. And I said, not to worry. I said, I have a small business. I understand how things like that can happen. He said, actually, it's a wee bit more serious than that. He said, your display actually went to the funeral home with a card that said, congratulations on your new location. So it's crucially important to get the right message to the right audience at the right time. And uh, we're going to see if we can make that happen this morning. Most people involved in agriculture, particularly those involved at the point of production, farmers and others who are working the land, working with animals, producing food for people all around the world, are primarily interested in protecting their freedom to operate. How do you do what you do best with a minimum amount of outside interference? Because you chose to go into agriculture and farming because you have a passion for agriculture, you have a passion for animals, you have a passion for the land, not because you wanted to get into public relations, issues management, or, politi or politics. You'd have chosen a different career if that were the case. So what I'm hoping that we're able to do this morning is to build a model that will end with helping to protect your freedom to operate. But it's going to look a little different than some of the historical strategies that we've used. Just a bit uh, more about my background. I spent 10 years as vice president of communications for uh, the largest swine integrator in the states uh, at that time. We were the first ones to take on financing from Wall Street. And when we were growing, we were building a barn and a quarter a day. So we were growing very, very rapidly. And we were not all that beloved by the communities in which we were growing. People were concerned about what we were doing to the environment, the size and structure of agriculture. And so we relied on two primary strategies to protect our interest. We knew we were going to have really good science and we were going to attack everyone who attacked us. Those were going to be the two strategies we were going to use to protect our interest. And what we saw over time was that those strategies no longer work. That's not an effective strategy in today's environment to protect your freedom to operate. So we're going to spend a little time talking about why those are no longer effective, and then more importantly, what is? What can we begin to do now to really help protect that freedom to operate? Because in today's environment, it requires you to consistently earn and maintain what we refer to as a social license. And we define that as the privilege of operating with minimal formalized restrictions based on maintaining public trust by doing what's right. And those restrictions can be imposed by legislation, by regulation, or more frequently today and more quickly through the market, where a company, a branded food company, a branded retailer can say, you know, I'm not comfortable with mulesing. We're not going to buy merino wool any longer. 
I'm not comfortable with how you're raising those animals. I'm not going to buy your lamb any longer. And in that instance, there's no promulgation process, there's no public hearing, there's no opportunity for you to engage unless you've engaged much, much earlier in that process. And public trust is a belief that your, or your activities are consistent with social expectations, the values of the community, and other stakeholders. So what do people think about what you do, and is what you do consistent with their values? And I think I can make a fairly compelling case for doing the right thing as being the best thing for your business. Because at the end of the day, if these decisions don't add to the bottom line and don't protect your freedom to operate, you really shouldn't engage in them. But I was very impressed with Jason's presentation yesterday, and a lot of the points that he made, I think, will dovetail into what I'm talking about this morning. You'll notice there on the left-hand side of the screen that we're talking about social license. And you're granted the social license to kind of operate with minimal formalized restrictions when the perception is that your practices are consistent with the ethics, the values, and the expectations of your stakeholders. So if they believe you're kind of committed to doing what's right, they won't feel the need to impose more social control. That gives you the opportunity to have more flexible systems, more responsive systems, and therefore lower cost systems. I'll give you another illustration from my experience in the pork industry. At that farm where we worked, we had a series of relatively high profile manure spills. And the state of Missouri came in and they said, I'm sorry, but you have violated the public trust for how you manage the waste from your livestock. So we're going to take away your social license and we're going to replace it with social control in the form of more stringent regulatory requirements for manure management. And we knew from our benchmarking service that our cost of environmental compliance was now six times our industry competitors. So we made ourselves significantly less competitive because we lost that social license and we saw greater social control. So there's significant economic value in maintaining the social license. The other thing we tip typically take for granted in agriculture that we don't understand quite as well is that that social license applies to the entire category. It applies to the group. Historically, we've kind of assumed that the negative consequences for a bad actor will accrue only to the bad actor. Not the case. If somebody decides, if a branded food company decides to stop buying wool because of mulesing, it doesn't only impact the farm that was captured on video. It impacts everybody in the sector. The same thing happened in our situation in Missouri. The state of Missouri didn't say, we're going to pass regulations for your company. They said, we're going to pass regulations for everybody in this category. That means you have a collective interest in the activities of every single farmer because your social license is dependent upon how your neighbor operates his farm. That's a different way for us to think about how we operate in agriculture. How do we create that culture that respects the independence that has become the foundation and backbone of who we are and what we do, but still recognizes the need for us to collectively work together to maintain that level of public trust to protect your social license? And you've seen that clearly be threatened when we've had the, the musing incident, where activists have said, you know, this is a practice that we think is a violation of the public trust. We think it's inconsistent with the values and the expectations of stakeholders. We think it should go away. So they work hard to make that a tipping point so there's more social control. And they use the marketplace to drive that social control. And you've clearly seen the results of that, where fashion chains threaten Australian wool boycott, You've seen several brands that have stepped into that space. And you can anticipate more of this over time. And we'll talk about the dynamic relationship between activist organizations or NGOs and your production practices more a little bit later in the presentation. But when you start to see high profile brands associated with your products, their primary job is to protect the value of that brand, not to protect your ability to do what you do on your farm. So how can we do a better job of working with them to understand that those practices are in the animal's best interest? Not in your best interest, but in the best interest of the animals. So social license, as I mentioned before, is based on maintaining public trust. And historically, I've spent a lot of time trying to work on agriculture's image. And we had a stakeholder engagement process a few years ago where we had people from across the entire food chain in the room having a conversation about these issues. And it was a person responsible for social responsibility for one of the world's largest quick service chains who said, you know, you've got it all wrong. 
agri think, agriculture, you think you've got a problem with your image. It's not a problem with image, it's a problem of trust. People aren't sure they should trust agriculture anymore. And trust and image are two very different concepts. And so we took that to heart and we began to do some research on what does it take to build trust as opposed to change our image. Because they take you in two very, very different directions strategically. If you're focused on polishing your image, you engage in one kind of activities. If you talk about building trust, it's an entirely different kind of activity. So we partnered with Steve Sapp at Iowa State University, and we looked at 21 different pieces of research on the question of trust in food. And in each of those, we found three common drivers that you'll see there on the left-hand side of the screen. The first one at the bottom of the screen is influential others. That includes your family and friends and credentialed individuals whose opinions you respect. Could be a dietitian, could be a doctor, could be a veterinarian, could be a nutritionist, could be a lawyer. No, probably not a lawyer. Um, then the second element of building trust is competence. And that's our technical capacity, our skills, and our science. And historically, that's where we've spent most of the time talking about who we are and what we do in agriculture, right? We have good science and we need good science because you work in very narrow margin businesses where you have to continue to improve to remain competitive in a global market. The third element in building trust is confidence or the perception of shared values and ethics. In other words, can I count on you to do what's right? So we surveyed 6,000 US consumers over the course of three years on food safety and nutrition and animal care and on-farm sustainability and a wide range of issues related to farming and agriculture. And what we discovered was really interesting. What we found was that the perception of shared values and ethics is three to five times more important than demonstrating our competency in building trust. So we've had the communication equation exactly backward. We've assumed that people will be rational, that they will be data driven, and if we can simply give them enough information, they will come to our side of the argument and begin to support who we are and what we do which is why historically we've tried to educate the public. Because clearly if we simply give people enough data, they will come to our side because the data proves that we can do what we're doing. So we'll talk about a different approach and why that approach we don't discard it because we have to stay ingrained in science, it's crucial to what we do, but it can no longer play the lead role in our communication and outreach. What does it mean? It's the old quote from uh, former U.S. President Roosevelt, they don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care. And the challenge we have today is because of the geographical and generational disconnect that we have between the public and farmers, they're not sure you care anymore. If we're not out there helping them understand our commitment to doing what's right, they're no longer confident that we care the way we should. So we end up with these polarizing perceptions where you have good food or bad food, controversial food or non-controversial food, and you see that in the markets. And we'll talk some about what Coles and Woolworths are doing to exploit that and what it means to you as we continue to go forward. I want to shift gears and talk a little bit about values and ethics in our science-based culture. Uh, agriculture is very definitely steeped in science, and we should be, because we need good science, again, upon which to base these crucial, crucial decisions. But if we know values are what drives trust, can we better understand how we begin to engage in values-based communication? You're looking at that picture and you're probably thinking, I'll bet he was a male model. You would be wrong. That's Lawrence Kohlberg. He was a brilliant social psychologist at the University of Chicago in the 1960s. One of these guys who was just off the charts brilliant. Had his bachelor's degree by the time he was 18 and then just continued his studies. Dedicated his entire career to trying to figure out how people consider ethical or moral questions. When you're faced with an ethical or moral dilemma, how do you think about it? How do you begin to build a construct to make a decision? It's got three levels of six stages, and I want to use it to illustrate how sometimes we unintentionally undermine our own credibility simply by the language we use in our communication. So pre-conventional direct impact on me, stage one, punishment and obedience. I'm going to clean my room because if I don't, mom's going to be mad at me. Second, personal rewards orientation. What's in it for me? I'm going to make all of my decisions based on what's in it for me. The conventional level, first stage, good boy, nice girl orientation, what will people think about me or say about me based on what I do. The law and order orientation, I will be in compliance. Compliance should be sufficient. Then you move to the post-conventional principle driven. You've got the first one, social contract, what's in the best interest of the group. 
And then finally, a commitment to universal ethical principles, things like compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. Now, anyone in agriculture ever said, well, of course we take care of our land and animals because that's when we get the best return on our investment. Show of hands, anybody ever said that? Of course we do. What that implies is that the primary driver for all of our activities is the return on investment. We don't take care of the animals and the land because it's the right thing to do. We take care of it because that's when we make the most money. The implied message in that is if something else generates a higher ROI, we'll do that. So that message does not build trust in who we are and what we do. Or do we say, we're in compliance with all environmental laws and employment laws, regulations, leave us alone. Regulatory compliance should be sufficient. Or are we willing to say, as someone involved in the food system, I have an ethical obligation to my employees, to the animals, to the environment, to my customers, and to my community. And here's what I do to live up to that obligation every single day on my farm. Now, here's the really cool thing about this model. If you're a good farmer and you're doing the right things on your farm, it costs you nothing to move from the very bottom of Kohlberg's moral hierarchy to the very top. Reclaim the moral hierarchy. Reclaim the moral high ground. It belongs to you. Don't let the activists claim it. If you're doing the right things for the right reasons, then talk about it for that reason. Talk about your ethical commitment. Talk about your family heritage. Talk about the things that you do when it's unpleasant, when it's early in the morning, when it's late at night, to make sure your animals are well cared for. Sure, it also supports your bottom line, but you would not be involved in agriculture if your only concern was return on investment. You're involved in agriculture because of your passion to do what's right. So claim that and talk about it in that way. Help people understand that you recognize the obligation and you own it and you're willing to own it and claim that going forward. The other challenge we have is that NGOs, activist groups or advocacy organizations, however you define them, whether it is the Red Cross or Animals Australia, the perception is they are driven by something other than self-interest. And that puts them at the very top of Colbert's moral hierarchy. Now you can argue whether or not that's right, but it's reality. And in business, because we do have that profit motivation, we are perceived to be at the personal rewards orientation level. So when we come to the public discussion about who we are and what we do, and we're challenged by the advocacy groups or the activists, we have a significant credibility deficit that we have to overcome. Now again, is that right? Is it fair? It doesn't matter. It's real. So we have to deal with it. We have to figure out a better strategy. So if they come into the game with a home court advantage, that just means we have to be smarter and we have to play harder because we can't just simply eliminate that home field advantage. So we've got to have better strategies and we've got to execute them better in order to help the public understand that we deserve to be at the very top of that moral hierarchy so they can have trust in us and understand that we share their values because values are the foundation for building that trust. So when we talk about a sustainable balance at CFI, we use the triangle for that because of its great structural integrity. And the foundation is making sure that our practices are ethically grounded that we can communicate to people that we're committed to the values that are important to them. Things like compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth. But our practices are scientifically verified because we need that objective, measurable, repeatable data to prove the claims that we're making. And at the end of the day, if it's not economically viable, it's not truly sustainable. So never apologize for making a profit, but understand that economics and your economics aren't what drive public trust in who you are and what you do. Because historically, the questions that we get about agriculture today tend to be at the base of the triangle. Should you continue to be engaged in mulesing? Should you have that many lambs in a paddock? Should you be engaged in other kinds of practices in agriculture? And our historic response has been, well, science says we can. Can and should aren't the same question. Can is a question about our competency, our science and ability, should, is a question about our values and our ethics. Science will tell us if we can, society will tell us if we should. And if they feel strongly enough that we shouldn't, then they will pass laws or the markets will put in restrictions that will tell us we can't. So we have to have a really good answer to that should question, and we do. 
the practices in which you engage help protect animals, help provide better care for them. But we need to talk about the care and our commitment to caring for the animals, not just the science. Because the science in and of itself is not going to be persuasive. Because when we give people information about economics and science, we increase their knowledge, but we may do nothing to change how they feel or what they believe. And people are much more likely to act on how they feel and what they believe than on what they know. And we've been guilty in the past of sometimes substituting scientific verification for ethical justification. They aren't the same. Just because we can doesn't mean we should. So we have to answer that should question so that those consumers and customers and others who have questions about whether or not we should can feel comfortable that we share their values and we're committed to doing what's right. If we can answer that question, it helps build that social license and protect your freedom to operate. One of the things that we've seen happen very rapidly really now are brands operating as agents of social change. And the dynamic here in Australia is truly unique. With the duopoly at retail, you have unique challenges that I've not seen anywhere else in the world. Regulation versus market pressure in terms of what works, the NGOs have discovered it's much more efficient for them now to work through the market. You can see the Greenpeace slogan, we can dance with you or we can dance on you. That's how they approach the market. So if you're a company that gets approached by Greenpeace, you know you're going to dance. The question is, who's going to lead? And then where are we in that conversation? And because of the integration and the consolidation you've seen in retail now, with Coles and Woolworth controlling 80% of retail sales, the target list for the NGOs is very clearly defined. They know exactly where to apply that pressure in order to change production practices all the way back to the point of production. This is from the Animals Australia website and their campaign to get chooks out of, uh, out of cages. Uh, you can see some of the, the basic rhetoric and all of you have seen that. And here they are applauding Cole's decision uh, to phase out caged eggs. And this is from them. You can see this announcement is another indication that Coles is acknowledging that consumers do not accept the cruelty that is routinely inflicted on animals in factory farms. Coles has recently shown important ethical leadership, and we challenge other supermarkets to demonstrate that they, too, care about the welfare of animals. Now, from the Animals Australia Unleashed site, which is a site you can click on and link there, we see the response from a Coles customer service representative to someone who wrote in to thank them and congratulate them about their decision. So this is language coming from Coles. There is no doubt there is a growing concern for the welfare of farmed animals in Australia. And over the past couple of years, Coles have made some considerable commitments regarding our sourcing policies. By 2014, Coles will no longer sell any fresh pork products that have been uh, farmed using sow stalls. And by 2013, we will no longer source caged eggs for our Coles brand. We've also uh, changed our store egg layouts with free range and RSPCA certified eggs now being displayed in a more prominent position than caged eggs. Additionally, to help make the transition from cage to free range easier for our customers, we've substantially reduced the price of our Coles brand free range eggs. Coles invests a lot of effort into ensuring we meet our customers' expectations. We will continue to review our policies and work with our suppliers in this regard. This is today's reality. So what are the issues? What are the pressure points? And what are you doing today to make sure you are embedded in that conversation about those practices at Kohl's? Not to defend them, not to necessarily have an argument, not to cry and prove that they're wrong and you're right, but how are you embedding yourselves in those systems to make sure you have a voice at the table when that conversation is being held? Because today, transparency is no longer optional. We clearly saw that in Jason's presentation yesterday, where somebody with a cell phone captured what was taking place uh, out in that field with all of the dead lambs, and it gets posted. It gets posted very quickly. You need to assume that someone is watching everything you do all the time. That's a safe assumption today. And to ignore that, or to assume if your risk management strategy is no one will find out, that's a very short-term very high risk strategy in today's environment. We've seen a phenomenal explosion in social media that all of you are aware. Roughly 2 billion people are connected to the internet today. By 2015, 80% of the global population will have some mobile device that can be both a receiver and more importantly, a transmitter, where the information they decide to share can make it around the world in a matter of seconds. 
We send 2.9 million emails every second, upload 20 hours of video to YouTube every minute, send 50 million tweets a day, 700 billion minutes of Facebook time every month. If Facebook were a country, it would be the third largest country in the world behind India and China. And social media now accounts for nearly 25% of time spent online, and my two daughters in their 20s probably account for about 10% of that 25%. Would, uh, would be my guess. So really today, anybody with a cell phone is a cinematographer. Anybody in this room could capture anything that happens anytime and immediately broadcast it around the world. So employees, consumers, customers, bloggers, and everybody has the opportunity to influence and talk about who you are and what you do at the speed of Twitter. So the question that I'd ask you to think about and to ask yourself is, not will you be transparent, but how are you gonna manage your reputation in today's age of radical transparency. Because being transparent is no longer an option. That question is off the table. So forget about it. So how do you manage your reputation in this age of radical transparency? We used to think about integration really kind of being production, processing, and distribution. But we realize today there's a whole new level of integration where the system really connects us with our customers, with brands, with restaurants, with retailers, with clothing buyers and designers. They are connected to NGOs, and so we are loosely connected to NGOs. So when an issue comes up, what infrastructure do we have in place to manage those increasingly complex relationships? Are we embedded at the NGOs? Are we embedded in our customers? Do they understand that we are a resource and not simply a supplier in terms of how they manage these issues? Then you add the new dynamic of social media to that and the immediacy and pressure that comes when an issue comes to, to, to the fore and it becomes really uh, very volatile. And today, in most of agriculture, we're not well prepared to manage this new dynamic environment. We need the resources, we need the training, we need to make sure that we've got the systems in place that can help us be successful. The good news is, I have every confidence that we can be, because there's no group that's more responsive to change than those in agriculture. People don't think of us necessarily as being terribly progressive, but you change all the time. You're always looking for a better way to do what you do. Improve genetics, improve nutrition, ways to continue to improve your on-farm practices. We have to now link think for new ways about how we're gonna protect that social license and freedom to operate. I had the pleasure of being on a panel in 2010 with Ray Goldberg, who founded the uh, agribusiness program at Harvard, and I captured one of his comments because I thought it was really poignant there's a thin line today between public, private, and NGO management of the food system. We have to create managers where and how the public, private, and NGO communities work together to manage the food system. That's a new challenge for all of us. How do we create the skill sets and the people who can work in that environment and work in that environment in a way that helps protect your freedom to operate long term? And can we begin to introduce into our organizations and into the supply chain partners a more holistic view of sustainable animal agriculture. So they begin to recognize the interrelated elements of all of these systems. That food today is raised and produced in a system, not in isolation. And if you change one part of that system, if you change housing, you change nutrition, you change genetics, you need to be able to think about what are the impacts on the entire system. We found this diagram to be extremely helpful in talking with our channel partners about, you know, we can certainly change housing. We can eliminate the use of antibiotics. We can eliminate the use of supplemental hormones. But what, was the in, what would the impact be on food safety? What would the impact be on the environment? What would the impact be on animal well-being? And most of them have not thought about it in that holistic way. Great opportunity to, to integrate and talk about that conversation in a more fundamental way. Because today we really are playing a brand new game. The basketball game, we used to think about, you know, if you're on the basketball team, you just have to play offense or you play defense. Not any longer today. You have to be willing to play offense and defense. You can't just be proactive or reactive. We have to be consistently interactive at every moment. And it's not just the players on the court that are playing against each other. You've got the referees and the folks at the scoring table that represent regulators and legislators that are watching it. And you've got people in the stands that are watching everything that happens, and people at home that are watching everything that happens in high def, where they can make comments and issue questions and tweet about what's going on. 
That's the environment we live in and work in today. It's a phenomenal fishbowl, and we have to be prepared and accept the fact that our practices will be under that level of scrutiny. So as we think about building trust, what's a model that helps us get to where we need to be? It starts on the left-hand side of the screen. We need to be able to articulate and write down and commit to a set of ethics that we're confident are consistent with the expectations of consumers. Can we say that we're committed to compassion, responsibility, respect, fairness, and truth? Here's what they can count on from us, and here's how we actually operate with those ethics and those values on our farm. Moving to the far right, best practices, certification, continuing education, playing off what Jason was talking about again yesterday a bit. It's a place where we do well, but we need to do better. And then where we have the biggest gap today is really that middle, the stakeholder engagement. Have we identified those stakeholders who can influence and change our freedom to operate? Do we know who they are? Have we developed those relationships? Can we maintain those relationships over time? Because those are the people who are going to find the pressure about whether or not we continue to have the social license and freedom to operate. I have every confidence that if Australian farmers are given the resources, the knowledge, and the support, without question, you will be able to develop the systems and put things in place that will help protect your social license and your freedom to operate. We're very excited to be working on developing an Australian Center for Food Integrity. Uh, I hope we're able to get that off the ground over the course of the next year. We've got some terrific people around the country who are committed and interested in that. If you're interested in being a part of that, I would be happy to uh, have some more conversation with you about that as well. We've got just a few moments for some questions. Be happy to throw it open to the floor for uh, anybody who has a question or a comment they'd like to offer. Yep, and uh, if you've got a question, just wait till I come through with the mic. Would you thank Charlie for his presentation so far? And did I see a hand in here somewhere? Sir, here you go. Great talk, Charlie. Um, there are some aspects of our behaviour which are a problem, like the, the dead lambs. And there are other aspects of our, what we do, which are pretty good, uh, like uh, biodiversity conservation, the endangered birds and so forth. There are, there are different sort of angles. Do we, is it better to work on the negative, reduce the negative, or to enhance the positive? And how do they interact in, in the consumer's mind? Great question. It's both and. And I'd like to make the distinction between these being consumer issues and being customer issues. Customers are those folks that you sell to initially. Most consumers do not get up in the morning thinking about the issues that we spend a lot of time on. They don't get up thinking about animal welfare. They don't get up thinking about these other issues when they go to the store and they buy some delicious chops. They want to bring them home and cook them. They're not wondering about what was the care of that animal for most consumers. But our customers definitely think about that. If you think about transparency, it's important to be able to talk about both of them very candidly. So here are the different programs we have on our farm today. We've made phenomenal progress in terms of conservation improvements and protecting soil and water resources. We continue to make improvements on animal care, and we recognize we have a way to go. Here's our plan. Here's our process. Here are the benchmarks that we have established for us to track our progress over time. I'd be happy to share our progress with you as we continue to meet those benchmarks. Here's the other key thing to realize and to recognize. Restaurants and retailers are not our enemies. These are people who want to sell our products. They rely on their ability to sell meat protein products. But we need to give them the support they need to feel comfortable about who we are and what we do. Most of them are not looking for perfection. What they're looking for is a genuine commitment to doing what's right. And they're willing to work with you unless there is some immediate high-profile incident that would threaten the value of their brand. So we have to be able to talk about both of them. We can certainly celebrate the successes, but we need to also acknowledge those areas where we're working on improvement because we can't assume that they're not going to know. And they'll smell farm washing. If, if, if it looks like we're only trying to sell them the good stuff, uh, then that comes through as being disingenuous. Now, right down the back now, Charlie over here. Yes. Got Andrew with us. Charlie enjoyed that immensely. The if we go back to the to the Coburg hierarchy. Yes. Um, top right hand corner where we had uh, animal ethics people at the top right hand corner. Yes. And you put us down the bottom right hand side. I, I'm, the question I have is. 
What happens when we're both up in the top right-hand side, so it becomes an argument about whose ethics is, is the right ethics? I mean, I'm talking about how somebody like Peter Singer uh, and my ethics are, are in conflict, because I, I actually think my ethics are better than his. Yep. Great question. And the thing that I admire about the question is you're willing to have the conversation about ethics, as opposed to saying, he's wrong and I have the science to prove it. So I think if we start with a common platform to say, we realize that everyone who cares for animals has an ethical obligation to make sure these animals are well cared for. And as a farmer, I'm out there making sure that happens every single day. But these animals are not pets. These animals are raised for food. But we recognize that they have, we have an obligation to treat them with respect, to make sure we provide for their well-being, and here's how we actually make that happen. That allows you to have that values-based argument, and what you will find is the rational majority of consumers who want to consume meat, milk, and eggs are going to support you in that position. I'm not interested in the lunatic fringe. I'm not interested in anybody who's more than about one and a half standard deviations from the mean. I either can't get them or I don't need them. So I'm not interested in talking to farmers a lot other than to see if we can create more conversation because they are already there and wanting to commit. I'm not interested in talking to Animals Australia because I'm not going to move them, but everybody in the middle, I think we do need to be willing to have that ethical conversation and not start that conversation by saying, those people are crazy, don't listen to them. Start the conversation by saying, you know, we all share an obligation to make sure animals are well cared for. And I certainly respect your concern about animals. Here's what we do on our farm to make sure that happens. I believe we're out of time. Do we have time yeah. for one more or are we done? No, we're going to bring an end to it there, unfortunately, okay. Charlie. But I did note we've had some tweets coming in while you've been on. And one is actually, well, there's been several from the Centre for Food Integrity. Is that your office that are tweeting you while you're here? It is. Yeah, those are it's our folks back in the States that are tweeting and kind of following the conversation that's taking place, uh, the, the Twitter feed, while we're here. Wow. We, and there was, they, that's there. And Lucinda Corrigan has said, glad you're back in Australia, Charlie, after Broom Workshop. My daughter hearing you this morning. Ah, oh, wonderful. Where's Lucinda's daughter? <laughs> is she up the back? There you go. Isn't that terrific? If she were still sleeping in, she'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> She Thank you again. I appreciate it very much. Yes. Big round of applause for Charlie Arnott.